3 billion devices run Java. At least, according to Java. And it's now known the log4 package in Java has a vulnerability and can be hacked. Yes. <laughs> Hi. If you're finding this video from the gaming community, whether it be Minecraft or some link or some reference or some tweet, uh, hello, my name is John Hammond. I make uh, cybersecurity videos here on YouTube, whether it be malware analysis, some dark web dumpster diving, uh, programming and capture the flag, anything in the sense of cybersecurity. And in this video, I want to talk to you about CVE 2021-44228 or this Java logging package called Log4j that is affecting so, so much out on the internet, including Minecraft. So this vulnerability really picked up some steam on December 9th of 2021, and I was kind of tinkering and working throughout the night to explore and experiment with it. So 5.30 in the morning on December 10th, 2021, I posted this tweet, and it got a little bit of traction. <laughs> and just following that, a few hours later, I was finally able to get remote code execution and fully take advantage of a Minecraft server. And I promised... I'll upload a video. So in this video, I would like to showcase how I had put together that exploit, that proof of concept. I'd like to showcase the other applications and scenarios you might find this vulnerable package in. And I wanna talk about what the industry is doing about this. I wanna talk about some of the detection, some of the prevention efforts. I wanna talk about the different bypasses. So both the blue team aspect and the red team aspect. And I wanna just bring as much information to you as I can. Now I have a hunch this is going to be a long video. So I will do my best to to include timestamps in the description so you can click along to different chapters of the sections that you might be most interested in. I will be showcasing the Minecraft segment uh, probably up front because I think a lot of folks might be really interested in that, but please bear in mind, Minecraft is just the tip of the iceberg in how many software applications and programs that this vulnerability affects. This is a zero day and what's so damning about this is that it's a cluster bomb of zero days because that log4j package might be in so many other other programs and software provided by different vendors and manufacturers. And while we, you, might be able to patch your individual installation or your code base that's using this log4j ap application, the vendors that are trickling and pushing their own code downstream, you might have to be kind of sitting on your hands waiting for that provider to push their security update. So at this point, a significant number of companies, organizations, businesses, software providers, security vendors are all talking about this. Twitter is talking about it. The whole internet is talking about it. Different spaces of the world, whether you're in cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFTs, this is seriously something that is a hot topic right now. We're all trying to understand, hey, who is affected, what is impacted, and because this is baked into some different applications and programs, it's hard to find and detect and know what is in fact vulnerable. So the first couple of blog posts that originally came out from this, I think around December 9th, were Lunasec. I think Lunasec was first to the punch and kind of getting some information out there. Uh, it explains more of the vulnerability and the details. Uh, and I've showcased and written that in some of my own blogs, which I have linked in the description. In fact, I will do my best to include just about everything that I showcase within this video in the links in the description below. An original proof of concept and exploit code has already been released and is public out on the internet. In fact, this GitHub has now been updated since it was originally hosting some other information. It now goes into even more detail and showcases other bypasses and some internal details of how this vulnerability works. Alongside this, there are numerous other repositories and information online as to how you could perform this attack and how you could set this up in a local testing environment if you don't have software that you already know is vulnerable. Just for some super quick show and tell, I do want to bring to light uh, an example of us using this log4j exploit. There are a lot of repositories that will showcase how you can set up your own test environment or simple Docker container where you can explore this vulnerability with lots of other references to other details and information behind it. Uh, this repository does offer a Docker container and explain how you can use and abuse this. So I'll go ahead and git clone this and showcase it over here on my terminal. Let's move into the temporary directory. I'll go ahead and git clone this here. And now I move into this directory, uh, we can view that readme file and explains how you could build this instance. You'll want to docker build this image and for the sake of showcasing, I will go ahead and just do this as root. Uh, so we'll go ahead and docker build this system, let it work 
if you don't have Docker installed, you can typically do a sudo apt install docker.io, add your user to the group, and I've showcased that in other videos. Once that is complete, we can review the readme one more time and get an idea for how to set this up. Looks like it runs the Docker container with removing it after it's completed, mapping ports 8080 to 8080. Uh, for the sake of me trying to roll with this, I'm gonna change that port to something that is not in use. And now I will open another terminal to work with this on the side. I'll move back into that same directory, cat the readme one more time to see how we can use this. If we wanted to make a curl request with a poison user agent, we could specify the header there with the JNDI inject, or the syntax that might let us actually see a connection come back. Uh, I'll go ahead and verify what my Docker instance is. Let me sudo bash one more time. And I will IPAS Docker 0. Looks like I'm running on 172.117.01. So let me go ahead and start up a netcat listener on, I suppose, port 8888. And I will open yet another terminal where I can go ahead and run the curl command that is explained in that readme file. You can see, hey, if you want to make a curl request with the poisoned payload, you can set a user agent header. And now this user agent will need the JNDI syntax that uses LDAP to make a call back to where your listener is or your attacker controlled server. Uh, and you'll connect that to, okay, the target that you actually want to see here. Let me go ahead and make that curl request. I'll copy and paste this and make those quick changes. Changes. I'll bring this up where you could see it. Now let's make these changes. As we saw from the IPAS output, the Docker instance is running at 172.17.01, and I have the Netcat listener running currently on quad 8, and we are connecting this to our vulnerable service, which is the Docker instance running, I believe, on port 555, as we had set. Now you could see, maybe just barely in the background, we did get our connection, and if we actually pivot back over to go see the instance, we can see, hey, we did in fact see a connection with the user agent that would get logged and bring us back, make the callback to our attacker controlled instance, in this case, just my netcat service. So now let's showcase how this can be done in an old and unpatched Minecraft server, which I've been using really as a test bed to showcase the impact and educate users and bring the messaging that this is a sheer insane vulnerability. Let's hop over to the computer screen. Now I'm on the Windows side. I'm using Windows to go ahead and host the Minecraft server, also using that as a client to connect to the Minecraft server. So truthfully, this isn't showcasing the impact for all of the other potential players in a Minecraft server. But I'm over here on this desktop and I've gone ahead and set up a paper MC or paper Minecraft server. Paper Minecraft apparently makes this super duper easy. I kind of had to learn and do some quick juggling on the fly. How do I actually set this up? Never done it before. So if you wanted to go ahead and download Paper, you very well could. On the hamburger icon here, you could go to the Downloads button and scroll down to check out some of the information. You can notice that Paper 1.0 18 and some others actually have their update and already have patched for the vulnerable incident with log4j. If you wanted to go take a look at some of the legacy packages that are in fact vulnerable, if you were trying to recreate this on your own, you'd be able to see, hey, you could download some of these other previous ones. Uh, truthfully, it doesn't look like it's hosting some of the others that it might have seen here because this vulnerability has been so massive. I'll showcase some of the other footage here where I actually had seen the previous releases. Now they've taken them down and off the website. In full transparency, I ended up setting this up with a old Paper Minecraft or Paper MC server version 1.88. I was able to track down the downloads for this by just kind of exploring how they structured each of their download directories, and I had ended up finding that given a version and build number, you could search for that download specifically. If I move into this downloads directory, let me see. Oh, it doesn't actually display any directory indexing. That's okay. Can I get specifically the version that I had downloaded previously? And I made sure to save this link. This is 188 build 443. Let's see if it is still being served and hosted. And no, it has currently been taken offline. That's a good thing. Now there won't be as many vulnerable Minecraft servers out there on the internet. This paper Minecraft server and Minecraft all in general does require Java. And I wanted to again, go for an old school version of Java where I know this would be vulnerable because I just wanted to showcase this exploit and get it to work. So I ended up finding some repositories where I could go ahead and download this online. And in fact, when I was still wanting to work with Java 8, I ended up finding that portableapps.com did in fact showcase and host some of these older versions. I wanted Java 8 181, which I could find for my 64-bit version of Windows here. Upon downloading that, I was able to go ahead and set things up, and I moved the installation of paper here onto my desktop in just a folder here where you can see that specific version number, 18443. 
Alongside it, I set up a start paper batch script, which if we just wanted to take a look at, all it simply does is it runs Java, which is the version that I just downloaded, 180.181, running this jar file. And let me show that to you super quick. I do have it in my path, so I can run Java tack version. And that is the version that I'm working with. You'll notice my username is Santa. I'm super sorry. Uh, I know this is supposed to be a cool professional learning video, but this is the virtual machine that I had used to prepare the Try Hack Me Advent of Cyber Learning Challenge. So fun Easter egg for current viewers that I have. If you're new to the channel, uh, go check out that video. So with that, I could move into my desktop and I could run that start paper.batch script. This will go ahead and start up the Minecraft server. If you haven't done this before, it does require you to agree to the end user license agreement, which is simple. All we need to do is open this file and change EULA to true. Nice and easy. And now let's restart that again. So at this point, the Minecraft server is running. I'll drag this over to the side here and I'll go ahead and get started with my Minecraft launcher. Now when I bring this up, I am running the Java edition of Minecraft and you can actually see, hey, there is some messaging and notification about the security vulnerability in this edition. If you want to go check out that page, Minecraft explains and tells you a little bit more about it. And this in fact tells you what you need to do to try and remediate or mitigate against this vulnerability. It does explain that the latest versions, 1.18, as you've seen that number around, is in fact patched and secure. If we actually go take a look at the installations, you might be able to see the patch notes even here. And this Minecraft Java Edition 1.81 explains that this release fixes a critical security issue for multiple servers. And that client version is patched. So upgrade Minecraft if that's what you're using. Now again, for the sake of showcasing, I had gone into installations and I had clicked on new installation to go find myself a different version or old school rendition of Minecraft. And in fact, I had been using that 1.8 way down below, 1.88. Now this explains that 1.88 is an older version that doesn't support the latest player safety features. Totally understood. However, I want to just explore this vulnerability. If I go ahead and hit play here, this will go ahead and start up Minecraft for me. And I'll resize the window to make this a bit more visible. So I'll move into multiplayer. So I have set up this Minecraft server, which is one that I simply added being the local IP address of this computer. If you aren't sure how to get that, you could simply open up the command prompt and ipconfig will show you, hey, your current IP address. Now I'll go ahead and connect to this Minecraft server, but I'll bring this window to the other side so we can kind of see these side by side. Of course, we'll go ahead and log in and we can see that, hey, my user has connected. And here I am being a Minecraft YouTuber. My mouse sensitivity is like super crazy. I don't understand this. So the danger in this Minecraft game is that if I were to enter into the chat, anything that I really wanted to send to other players, this is where the injection point is. So now that we've set up the vulnerable Minecraft server and the victim client, let's go figure out how the attacking machine is set up. I am going to move out of this virtual machine, bring this over to the side here, and I do have a Kali Linux instance, which is where I'll be showcasing how we could do this. So if you haven't seen it from any of the descriptions or anything that I've been showcasing thus far, the way that this payload executes is by a JNDI or the Java Naming and Directory Interface syntax. It makes a call out to an LDAP server, which will then be configured with an, a refer to send it back to an HTTP server, which will then execute and work with more code. Thus, the victim will then execute arbitrary code hosted by a hacker or bad threat actor. So if we are trying to recreate this locally, we need something to be able to actually host this LDAP refer server for us. Now, from the research that I had done thus far, this can be done with this MarshallSec utility, which is some great research done by other individuals showcasing this JNDI injection technique. Looks like they have actually updated their readme here to explain, hey, if you're looking for information on this CVE for log shell, this is what you could understand and learn more about it. Scrolling down, we can see the usage here to explain how to build and put this all together. It does note Java 8 is required, in which case I had gone and tracked down the, again, older version of Java and JDK so that I could be able to recreate this. Notice I'm trying to use Java 8 all across the board between the Windows victim and the Kali Linux attacking machine. I will open up another terminal window and I'll show you the Java version that I'm currently running is 1.80181, the same rendition on the Windows machine. I had downloaded this from this mirror root PAI in their JDK listing, grabbing that specific version number. But if you went to this page, you would get a secure connection issue in which case you can just visit this with HTTP instead. And there we go. This is a good listing of those different version numbers you might want. Again, I'm working with Java 8U181. And you can download that tar zip file, extract and run this as needed. 
Now going back to set up and work with this Marshall sec utility, let's get back to our terminal and I'll just make a temporary directory for me to work with in here. I'll go ahead and git clone this repository move into that directory and it said for the installation process you will need maven uh, m-a-v-e-n which again you can sudo apt install if you do not yet have it go ahead and run that command and it will go ahead and build this package for us in the targets folder as a reminder this marshall sec utility sets up our ldap refer it's not our payload but it sets it up so that we could then send a malicious payload what we had seen previously when we did that docker connection we had just ran with a netcat listener and let me view my IP address to be able to showcase this. Uh, we have 10.0.0.166. Let me start up a netcat listener on 999, I suppose. And I'll bring this window over to the side where over in my Minecraft instance, I could go ahead and run that malicious command. It looks like I see it's nighttime. So let me go ahead and try and type in the syntax here. I will use that dollar sign prefix in front of the curly braces. And it's jndi colon ldap colon slash slash the IP address that we want to connect to, which is that LDAP listener, right? So if I were to try and go to this IP address, uh, given the port, looks like I forgot the port there, so I need colon 999, that will see the connection come back. If I actually take a look at the logs of the server, you'll notice the original prefix didn't have those 999 port number there, but the other one did, and that's not being displayed here. We can see some damage potentially starting to be done with this, right? But that is the starting step. Now we need to actually set up this referral server to host malicious code. So let me hop back to this Kali virtual machine. I'll stop this netcat listener and review the syntax to run this. Now, there are a lot of examples showcasing how to do this. If you were to simply just search on GitHub for log4j, let me look for specific repositories throughout all of GitHub, there will be a lot of potential proof of concepts, the original one that we saw and others. This one specifically, Jajun325, was telling me a little bit more of how to actually set this up. You'll notice that you will need to host your own HTTP server with code that you can compile and have it do whatever you'd like, and then use this Marshall sec service with the syntax to go ahead and run the JNDI LDAP referral server, telling it what you want it to send it to with a specific class name or Java code that you would then like to execute. So let's go ahead and grab this syntax, move it back to our terminal and run this code here. I want this to call back to my IP address, which we saw from the IP address that I am 10, 1, 6, 6 as the last octet, and we'll go ahead and host a server on 8,000. And there we go. We'll set this up and you can see it is running an LDAP server locally or on all interfaces on port 1389. Now we would want to prepare our HTTP server hosting Java code that will then be executed on the target. So let me open another terminal here and I'll move back a directory and I'll show you how they kind of explain this in that repository here. You can see there's a Java folder that indicates, hey, you have the source code for log4j RCE being the proof of concept or exploit that you'd like to run. And then this showcases some example vulnerable code and how it might actually work. Using the log4j logger, it sets up any boilerplate things necessary, and then eventually, if it tries to log some information, specifically this payload syntax right now, it will reach out and then execute it because of our LDAP referral server. So let me show you this code that they're using. They just use a simple public class with the class name that matches the file, a static method, and a specific function for it. Interestingly enough, they also include the syntax that might execute arbitrary commands or do some damage that you would really want to do. So let's try and again, hippity hoppity, your code is now my property, slap that in here. Let's go ahead and create a POC directory. I will go ahead and mouse pad a log4jrce.java and then I'll slap this in to this text editor here. Saving this file so we get our syntax highlighting, we could have this display whatever we'd like, but truthfully, I wanna clean this up and have it execute a command to demonstrate our proof of concept work here and clean this up just a smidge. I'll remove that line and the Java Lang nonsense. So we'll just run the runtime exec command and we can pass in a string that we might want to run. I'll go ahead and start with a simple payload for calc.exe. Now with that complete, we can go ahead and compile this specific Java syntax. I'll use Java C and go ahead and compile our log4j jrce. If I ls in my current directory, we can see that that class file has been created and now we wanna be able to publicly host this on a port that we'll have our server call back to. So I'll go back to that other intermediary terminal here 
moved some things around so this is easy to see. And I'll go ahead and Python 3 HTTP server. So I am hosting a simple HTTP server at the moment. With that, we now have everything set up. So I'll move out of this Kali Linux instance while the listener for LDAP in the referral server is waiting to send it back to this 8000 port. We can then see how this looks from the Minecraft point of view. I'll drag this over switch back to Minecraft and run the same command, but now use something specific, or I'll go to 10.0.0.166, but now we're listening on port 1389, specifically for LDAP, and we know that we want to run that log4j RCE class. So now when I hit enter on this, look carefully at the left-handed side of the screen where Kali Linux and our attacker machine is running. We'll see the connection come at the very top window from LDAP, then we'll see it come down to our HTTP server, and we should see the calculator application pop up on the Windows victim. So I just tested it one more time to ensure that it works, and I wanted to make sure you'd be able to actually visually see the impact, but my face was in the way in the video, so I wanted to drag the camera up. So let me run the exact same command and look carefully. I'll hit enter, and there you can see we saw the connection come through from LDAP, we see the HTTP request, and down at the very, very bottom of this Windows machine, you can see that the calculator application has been started even twice because it made two requests there. And with that, we have proven remote code execution on the victim through Minecraft. We just hacked Minecraft. <laughs> but obviously I'm using a very simple, benign, innocent payload of just opening the calculator application. This grants an attacker the ability to do whatever they want. They could start up a cryptocurrency miner. They could begin a remote access Trojan, maybe a cobalt strike beacon. They could drop ransomware. It's really whatever they'd like. So for another proof of concept, let's actually get a shell on this machine using Minecraft in this JNDI log4j exploit. For the sake of demonstration, I'm going to make sure that Windows Defender is off. Uh, you should absolutely ensure that Windows Defender is on. You should be really using a solid antivirus. So I'm clicking in here and verifying that in Manage Threat Detection, let's turn real-time protection off. There we go. And now in our attacker machine, let's go ahead and Google for a PowerShell reverse shell syntax. Uh, and we could really grab any of these. Let me just grab a one-liner. Uh, Payloads All the Thing has some great ones, but this one should work just as easily for us. I am going to try to rip this. And I am going to want to PowerShell encode this uh, base64. I think there's like a Raikou, this thing. I want to be able to base64 encode this so it's a quick and easy sample. Uh, this will, however, need to be bypassing AMSI or the anti-malware scan interface. So just for the sake of showcasing again, I'll go to AMSI.fail, Flangvix tool that does incredible stuff. Let's grab a Rasta mouse bypass ASI, uh, AMSI scan buffer patch syntax that's just showcasing C sharp. And I believe that will be fine with new lines, but I'm not quite sure. So let's go ahead and find out. Uh, we will want to modify our reverse shell syntax to actually call back to our attacker machine, right? So let's use 10.0.0.166 yet again. Um, and then let's use a different port this time, I suppose, um, 9898. Now, let's go ahead and encode this. There we go. And I have all of this giant, disgusting PowerShell syntax, but let's go modify our exploit code and see this in action. I'm going to use mousepad yet again to modify our log for JRCE JavaScript and then replace where we were originally just running calc.exe. Let's go ahead and slap all of this in. And let's just see if this works. I'm not a thousand percent confident, but let's try to use Java C to compile this yet again. Um, and now that that's been done, we can start up a netcat listener on port 9898. Let's move our Kali Linux instance over to the left-hand side of the screen. Let's go back to the game and try and run the same thing again. We see the connection and we do have a connection in Netcat. So if I were to bring that up super quick, let me try and run the who am I command just to verify we are on the box. And yes, I am Santa running on the desktop of that victim Windows computer. And now I could do anything. I could, I could do privilege escalation. I could do lateral movement. I could add persistence. I could be a threat actor and do any portion of the attack kill chain, the cyber kill chain, and do some later damage. So that is that vulnerability showcased within Minecraft. But there is so much more to this. Minecraft is just one small piece of this cluster bomb of a zero day. Now, I only want to show you this in the context of old, deprecated legacy, unpatched, 
Minecraft. Minecraft has itself patched for paper server versions, the latest rendition for the Minecraft client, etc. And I wanted to just raise awareness with how this might affect the gaming community to keep those players safe. You should be running antivirus so those threats don't come through. You should be updating, you should be patching. You know the drill. So now I've shown you the red team perspective from the adversary, at least in the case of Minecraft. But let's talk about the greater repercussions and how the industry is responding to this for blue teaming and defense and protection and detection. What I had showcased in those simple proof of concept examples in the Docker container or within Minecraft were just a flat vanilla basic syntax. However, there are now being lots of different bypasses or attempts to kind of obfuscate it or hide it so it's not easily detected or is trapped and not stopped by web application filters. And we are seeing lots of active in the wild exploitation of this. This doesn't really have any specific target. It's not targeted, right? Anyone could just spray and pray across the internet. Some of the great folks over at Grey Noise are in fact seeing, hey, active exploitation from different actors and different IP addresses. In fact, they've created a tag to be able to categorize and determine, hey, okay, if we want to do some better research and actually get some specific host names and IP addresses that defenders could use to block at the edge or just have the threat intelligence, that is now all public and out and about. They've shared some great gists or again, snippets of code and text and information out on GitHub. If you have any interest, again, these links will be in the description, but you can see about 100 at first, now about 150. I don't believe this link has been updated just yet, but those specific IP addresses, and then what in fact is the syntax that they're using, or what payload are they actually firing back? We could actually use this to maybe potentially examine what payload is being used. If you could still find this online, reach back out to it, pull down the payload and commands detonated. But look at this significant number. A couple of the really interesting ones are in fact using one well-known and kind of easily off the shelf accessible GitHub repository that just shows how to do this JNDI exploit with the command base64 included in the URL. That one's actually worthwhile and really interesting because the base64 code itself, like the command that's being run is present and you could find that within logs. There are other great tweets, other great individuals showcasing, kind of, again, acting as a megaphone to amplify this information, how you could track it down, know what's required for this attack to be pulled off, how you can mitigate it, etc. Another researcher, Florian Roth, has started to create, again, more detection efforts and his own utility, a Python script that might help you look for this sort of activity, all the malicious indicators inside of your own logs, if you're working with a server that could very well be vulnerable to this. Use this, take advantage of it, explore it. If you feel like you need to go do this firefighting within your own organization, these are some great resources, and it truly shows the community coming together here. At the moment, the real threats and the payloads that we're seeing included in this active in the wild exploitation have so far just been cryptocurrency miners and botnets. Now that's not to belittle or and trivialize those, but we aren't currently seeing remote access Trojans or cobalt strike beacons, ransomware. This could very well be further down the line with more days of exploitation, some ransomware Armageddon. Additionally, there is some chatter out on the Twitterverse that this attack vector, this JNDI injection technique, has been known and publicized and, and, and talked about. In fact, there was a presentation back at Black Hat USA in 2016 all about this sort of attack and what could be done from it. And it says right there, if we dive into it, applications should not perform JNDI lookups with untrusted data or user input. Now, there are a lot of people very upset that if there is this five-year-old attack vector, this vulnerability that we could have known about, and there is even some chatter looking back at like the reports and bug fixes and pull requests for this project, bringing in this feature, quote unquote, now becomes this bug and potential vulnerability. A lot of people are not all that happy. Now, with that said, there is no shade or hate or any bad mouthing towards those developers. This is not a reflection of them. Uh, it's not, they, they do this work volunteer, right? This is a project. This is a labor of love. This is a passion that they enjoy. And we should not by any means be offering any discomfort or malice towards them. This is just the world that we're in right now. And what could come from this vulnerability? Now, in case some of you might be saying, hey, John, it's been a day, you know, De December 10th is kind of when you got this thing popped on Minecraft. December 11th is when you're recording and releasing this video. What the heck have you been up to? 
Well, I have been trying to fight fires here, right? You know, be in the trenches, raise the awareness, keep pushing the education, get the threat intelligence out there, talk to folks, reassure them if need be, help determine what is vulnerable and what isn't vulnerable. And a lot of that can be reflected in the blog that I had written through my own day job and employer Huntress. Hopefully that offers a little bit more insight on kind of what we've been up to and uh, how we can help. One thing that we are very, very pleased with, and I'm very proud we were able to get across the finish line, is that there is now a free, open, and accessible utility, open source, you can find the source code on GitHub that I will showcase, a Log4j shell tester. So if you don't know what application might be vulnerable to this or is using the Log4j package somewhere in its internals, you can slap in a payload, like the same syntax, the JNDI and LDAP code that I was using in Minecraft as the user agent in that simple docker image proof of concept and you can test like the best verification and the validation that you could get does it make a connection does it call back to something remotely there is no code that executes on your machine nothing is like deployed or detonated on the target on the victim it's simply doing a lookup and doing a quick check in connection hey do we actually see the vulnerability here and the source code is available on GitHub if you, for some reason, hey, don't trust us, you want to review it and make sure that it's doing nothing other than making that connection that is available for you. For a, another quick show and tell, let me showcase how you can actually use that Huntress Log4 Shell vulnerability tester. Let me spin up that Docker testing environment one more time, and I'll go ahead and actually try to exploit this with the payload that is generated and given here. So I'm going to open up a yet another terminal. So I will go ahead and select this payload, and then I will go ahead and run that curl command as we saw previously, using a specific user agent that allows us to just pass this in. We'll slap it and paste that payload. And again, we want this to connect to currently listening localhost for my test bed on port quad five. Now, when I hit enter, we should see that there was some connections down below and that has logged. So if I go view the connections, given our Huntress log shell tester here, we will see that, oh, there's my IP address, there is the connection time, and I could use this to verify that application that I was using was in fact vulnerable. I hope this helps people across the industry because the hardest thing about this vulnerability is that it could be baked in to so many different programs and applications and we just don't know unless we were to try and test this. Like you could look for, hey, files that might be named log4j, but that has both false positives and false negatives because you might not know the version number or you might not know if it's actually in use between some portion of the application. So hopefully having this to send a benign payload and just be able to test and see the connection will give you a sanity check. Yes, no, something a little bit better than just blindly guessing. And hey, just as a reminder, uh, this is just copy and paste. You don't need to have the technical chops to be using curl. You don't need to be setting user agent. You literally just need that syntax and slap it into anything that you see, put it into input forms, put it into user logins, put it into things that you just might access any page with or something that could very well be logged in any application. It's just a matter of copying and pasting and trying it. Okay. I think it's time I try to wind this video down. Um, it's been a long video and I know there's a lot of info. I'm showcasing a lot of stuff, uh, but I want to show just how much you could see, you could learn, you could explore if you went out and looked around. If you stayed up to date with your vendors, your software suppliers, the providers that you work and integrate with, uh, and check to see, hey, is the application that I might be using vulnerable with hopefully some of the tools accessible with the information that you now know and hold them accountable, right? Like we this... This takes a village. This takes everyone playing in concert. And I hope that's been some incredible thing for you to see is this absolute outpouring of everyone in the industry on Twitter in different facets of the world that we live in uh, rising together to tackle this thing because it's big and bad and not to be fear mongering not to be hey fear uncertainty and doubt uh, but honestly uh we're doing everything that we can you know we've been working some sleepless nights i know that you have probably listening and watching this you just as well but we are just at the front of it and i have to think we might see this vulnerability for years to come because there might be software that just won't update and push this maybe it's dead or deprecated or legacy code this very well is like another shell shock like vulnerability in its sheer scale and we'll see it from now on
So my lasting thoughts, right, as we start to tune this video out, thanks for sticking with it to the end. Uh, hey, I hope you learned something. I hope this showcased something cool, something interesting, uh, and helps get you more in the know as to what is going on. And if you're an organization fighting fires in the trenches, you need this help, hopefully you have some other resources that can better help you. Lots of links in the description, hopefully timestamps just as well. Thank you so, so much for watching this. Uh, I hope that it offers you something new. And if you're coming from the gaming community, if you're over there, one of those Minecraft fellows to check this video, out please stay please stick around take a look at the channel and see what other new things you could learn because you are working on a computer you're playing with technology and software and security and that's not something that you can just kind of set and forget or put over in the corner or put your feet up on the dash and wait for incidents to happen you have to earn security you have to fight for it every single day so thanks so much i'll get off my soapbox <laughs> it's been fun everybody i hope you learned something i love you and i'll see you in the next video